Welcome to my new little series. I haven't done these in a long time. It's called What They Should Have Taught You in School. I'm going to talk about science of sales, persuasion, closing, negotiation, all those things. Give you seven strategies. Isn't it a weird world that uh, the most correlated uh, skill that you can have, actually the most causative skill you can have when we're talking about income, is sales. And there's no high school class. There's no junior high class. Maybe they got. Maybe you could count the uh, old grandma. Uh, what do Girl Scouts learn how to sell cookies? That's probably should be more of that, not just for Girl Scouts. Because a great book that I recommend everyone read. It's on my books list. Is uh, the Self Made Billionaire Effect? When they did an exhaustive study of billionaires, and they looked at their come up. You know where they start. And they, by the way, only self made billionaires. 60 to 70% of them started in sales. Ray A. Kroc, who became the richest man in the world, didn't really start till he was like 50. Bought, bought McDonald's from the McDonald's brothers here in LA. I'm actually at my grandma's here, a little makeshift studio. My grandma's 101, so she just had her birthday. I flew in for that. Um, I'm living more on the East Coast. And uh, anyway, so I'm reading this book. I'm going, Ray A. Kroc, okay, that's one. The guy was selling milkshakes door to door until he ran into the McDonald's brothers, used his sales skill to build the biggest restaurant franchise in history, McDonald's, right? And then I go, well, maybe it's just that. Maybe it's like, okay, well, Warren Buffett says the thing that changed his life the most was he took a Dale Carnegie class on, you know, Dale Carnegie, how to win friends, influence people. Like he learned social skills. He learned how to read people. He learned how to talk to people, how to motivate people how to get his point across. And so Warren Buffett, you know, second richest man in the world. Um, you look at uh, Bill Gates, the story of Bill Gates, who was 17 times richest man in the world. What did Bill Gates do? When he was 16, 17 years old, he used to get on the phone and call. And he, he has stories where he would lower his voice because he didn't want people to know that he was like under 18 years old. And he'd be like, oh, yes, this is uh, William Gates. I would like to call you. And so sales. Steve Jobs. What was Steve Jobs like really good at? I mean, he was an inventor, designer, creator, sure. But what's like when you like go down and nitty gritty read the story? It's the story. They're in the garage. Wozniak's the guy doing the techni technical stuff. And Steve Jobs go out, goes out and starts selling it. And a computer store places an order in the 1970s. And the next thing you know, you have the largest company in history, Apple, trillion, first trillion dollar company. So at the end of the day, you know, this is something they should have taught you in school. So I'm just going to jump into it and just go, if it's true, if these accountants who wrote the book, uh, The Self-Made Billionaire Effect, are in, a fa in fact correct, and 60 to 70 percent of billionaires, self-made billionaires, started in sales, and we go to school to learn in great part, how to advance our career. Why isn't this taught? There's no, I'll tell you the best college degree, or not the best, but a college degree that is insane because it doesn't exist, that it, or it's insane that it doesn't exist, sales. Why aren't people coming out with a four-year degree in sales? Negotiation, closings, it's whatever. Society, what's, what's up should, is down in reality. What's down should be up. That's just the world we live in. Everything's backwards. So I hope this little series that I'm starting to do here for my podcast and my YouTube and Facebook, I, wherever this is reaching you, I hope you really take some notes and dig deeply because I'm going to open up the war chest that I've accumulated. And there's people who are better at sales than me, but I will tell you, I've learned from smart people. Um, certainly, I know how to reach a lot of people. I'm somewhat controversial, which I'll talk about in sales. Don't be afraid of a little controversy. It makes you viral. Um, and last check, let me see here. My YouTube channel, I've reached, I don't know. Last I looked, it was 1.7 billion. Pull up my little analytics here. Watch time. I like watch time more than view time, but here you're at 1.8 billion minutes, 1.873. So I've certainly sold to people before, hundreds of millions of people. I've seen my videos. So I'm going to give you the insight that I've gained. I've spent over $50 million of my own money learning this the hard way. And so 
whether I know everything, I don't know everything. There's people, like I said, that are better, but I've been in sales for a long time. I started door to door sales, selling health insurance for a company called American Republic, doesn't even exist anymore in North Carolina. And then I went on and started working for GE, which was the largest company in the world. I worked as a contractor, had my own business wealth management company, called people cold calling, selling hard stuff, whether it be financial products, life insurance. You know how to be good at sales and closing? Start with something hard. Life insurance, no one told me at the time that it was hard. But looking back, I'm going, wow, I had to tell people, hey, you wanna spend money now so that when you die and can no longer benefit from this, somebody else gets money? But I was able to sell a lot of that and um, build a company with 6,000 customers in almost 50, I think all 50 states or close to 50 states. And, or um, was it all, I don't know. We had 45 plus states and most of that was on the phone. Phone sales are hard. Now I do in person. Now I've spoken on stages with, you know, 20, 30,000 people on them. So I'm not trying to brag. I just want you to know that this stuff is not being taught to you out of some textbook that a bunch of academics put together compiled. I am giving, going to give you some tips from my mentors and my business partners. One of my business partner, well, my main business partner and I have now sold over a billion dollars online and we've spent over $500 million, him more than, more than me. And so I've learned from him as we work together, building companies like MentorBox. And so let's dive into it. Seven strategies. Okay. How to be more persuasive. And by the way, so number one, number one of the seven strategies is actually understand what sales is. Number one, actually understand what sales is because the reason I think that sales isn't taught more is because people think that sales is manipulation, it's pushiness, it's forcing people to do something they don't wanna do. No, write this down. Sales in the modern world, that's why I call this the new science. It's changed over time. I can't tell you about sales in the 1400s or something. But I can tell you right now in the modern world that the average person is seeing one to 10,000 ads a day. People selling them something, TV, Google ads, banner ads, you know, video, YouTube video ads. And uh, so the modern version of sales is can you get people to listen to your side of the story? That's sales. At its very core, it's getting people to actually listen to you because they are bombarded. They are tired. Attention spans have dropped. We now have the average American has a shorter attention span than a goldfish. I think goldfish are like six or seven seconds and the average American's <laughs> attention span is like five seconds. So that's a rough place to get your point across. Maybe you're an entrepreneur. Maybe you have a new idea. Maybe, by the way, you're not a salesperson and you just have a job. Well, what if you want a promotion? What if you want to be a leader and manage a team of people? What if you want to get a promotion? You're going to have to get other people to hear your side of the story. Not everybody's going to buy. See, when you go into sales with the perspective of how do I get everybody to buy from me, you're breaking the first strategy, the first rule of the new science of sales, which is it's not to force your way on people. It's only to speak and elaborate in such a way that they get your side of the story. Remember, if you study things like narcissism, I, I, one of my mentors is one of the greatest psychologists in history, evolutionary psychologist, Dr. David Buss. I'm very lucky to have him as a mentor. I talk to him you know, weekly and for years, and he wrote the textbooks that are used at Harvard and all these schools. He was at Harvard, now he's at University of Austin. And he wrote the book on evolutionary psychology, the textbook. And what he's taught me about narcissism is that, see, scientists, this is why you have to learn sales. If you go back to the old beginning psychologist, Sigmund Freud, let's say, uh, Jung, these beginning people, they begin to understand that there's this part of the mind that's very deep, deep below the surface. It's called the subconscious. And they divided it up in weird ways. The, the, you know, you had the id, the driving force, and then you had the superego, which was kind of like, the voice of morality telling you what to do and you had the ego and all this stuff, right? Forget that. That's not really, that's kind of old science. But one thing we know is that humans are driven by subconscious 
subconscious factors. You can call them instincts. You can call them subconscious is, is a good way to, to talk about it. Uh, Sigma Freud called it the pre-conscious. You have the conscious, the pre-conscious, the subconscious, okay? Well, here's why this is important for you today. <laughs> um, people's subconscious tells them to just take care of themselves, to narcissistically only care about themselves. What is in it for me, baby? So if you go to your boss and say you want a job, a raise, you're just causing them problems. Now they got to go get it approved. Or if you're going to somebody and you've got a, a business, a new product, you're selling on Amazon, you're doing real estate, you're negotiating a deal. Well, all those people care about is themselves subconsciously, even if they're good people, that's the conscious mind. Subconsciously, people want to hear only their side of the story. So they're listening to you, but they're not hearing you. You see, they're listening to you. And if you're not good at sales, people will listen to you, but they won't hear you. You see what I'm saying? It's going in the auditory, <laughs> it's going in the ear, but it's not computing in the brain. They're not gonna change. They're not gonna do something just because you're a good person, no. And that's called the theory of the mind. And when we're born, we're very selfish. Every baby is selfish. You get on an airplane with a baby, they don't care if everybody around them will be disturbed. A little baby will scream if they don't feel good. Now, by the time you're about five or six, you begin to notice you're not the only person in the world. That's called the development of the theory of the mind, right? So all of a sudden, if you cry too much, other kids in class say, shut up. And you start to feel bad and you start to go, ooh, my actions affect other people. Well, the reason the first strategy is to get people to hear your side of the story is that a lot of people that you know never develop past about age 10. So yes, they started noticing other people are important around them by five, six, seven, eight, but people have stunted growth. And in the modern world, narcissism for sure is up. I was reading a book, The Law of Human Nature uh, by Robert Greene, which is a psychology type book. And he says, science is showing that narcissism has increased massively since let's say, I think he said 2000 in the last you know, two decades. So it's even worse than when Sigmund Freud was talking about narcissism. People now really only care about themselves. So to be good at sales, closing, persuasion, negotiation, all it starts with is speaking in such a way that they not only listen or pretend they're listening, but they hear you enough that potentially they'll change what they were doing. They'll change their routine. They'll change their buying habits. They'll stop buying from their, your competitor and buy from you. They'll stop selling that real estate deal to somebody they wanted. I'll tell you a story. I knew a guy who was a master at sales. He went in to buy, I don't remember all the details now, this is a while ago, but he went in and it was a real estate deal. And, he, and the property was like a million bucks. And they already had somebody who was gonna buy for them for a million bucks. Oh, I remember this. I remember it. It's a story. It's a famous story. Um, and so he went to them and he didn't even have a million dollars for the property. And he said, I can give you 950,000. Now, normally that's the worst sales pitch in history, right? They had a million dollars for their house and he was offering them 50,000 less. Don't hold me to the exact numbers, but something like this. But he told him a story before he made his offer. He said, this house is important to me. I just moved back to the area. I need to be near my family. My daughter has cancer. And I need to be close to family and take care of her and so on. This house is a perfect fit. It allows my family members to come and so on and so forth. And he told him a story. He wasn't even trying to sell him. Or maybe he was a master of the new science of sales. I don't know. But I will tell you, they called the buyer who was going to give him a million bucks and they said, sorry, we're selling to someone else. And the guy said, ah, I'll give you a million five. I'll give you a, you know, a million fifty thousand for it or 1.1 million. They said, sorry, we've made our decision. We're selling it to the person who's only giving us 950,000. Why? Why was that person good at selling? Because he spoke their language. He spoke in such a way that they heard deeply in their inner core and they changed their behavior. And that's a master salesperson. Notice, he wasn't pushy. He probably didn't even expect that they would buy the house, or that they would sell the house for less than it was worth, 50,000 less. 
but he knew how to communicate in such a way that he touched them at their emotional core and he ended up getting the deal. We'll always remember that. It's not always the strongest. It's not always the smartest. This is the famous quote about, Sigmund, uh, about Charles Darwin. There was a professor, Mendel, uh, Meganson, who said, if you want to understand what Darwin said, it's not the smartest, it's not the strongest that survive. It's the most adaptable to the environment in which they find themselves. So, strategy number two, I gave you number one. Number two is sales equals adaption. Great sales equals amazing adaption skills. Now, this is very counter what people tell you, okay? Because a lot of sales, for example, when I started out in sales, you get a script. And they're like, don't, just say the script. And I understand, I have salespeople, and sometimes I tell them, stick to the script. But I tell them that's when you're a white belt. When you become a black belt working for me, there is no script. You are the adaptable person. It's like Bruce Lee said, he said, water fills the shape of the cup. If it's a little teacup, the water just fills air. If it's a tall, thin cup, like a champagne, you know, it fills the whole thing. He said, be like water, my friend. And so to be great at sales, that must be the approach. And that's why I don't like most of the sales systems out there. I've tried them. If they worked, I'd do them. But what's allowed me to reach, you know, arguably as many people as almost anybody in history with sales messages through social media and through the videos and internet is that I've always believed in this adaptability phrase. So I'll give you an example. When I first started out in sales, there was a guy, one of the first people I ever trade, his name was Justin Stainback. He lived in Raleigh, North Carolina. I was building a little sales team for one of my companies. And he had his like way of, of getting his point across and persuasion and closing deals. He, would, he, would, he was from the South. He was very kind of soft-spoken. He was polite. He wasn't pushy. So he was do, we were doing a big financial deal, a six-figure deal plus. He, he, he might make 50000 commission from this deal. And he's talking to the guy in New York, and you could tell the guy in New York was like this Italian, like very stereotypical, kind of mean New Yorker or Kurt New Yorker. And I said, I listened to Justin try to close this deal. Couldn't close it for a week. Couldn't close it for a month. And I came to Justin. I said, you're going to have to adapt and adjust your sales pitch, man. This one's not working. I said, yell at the guy. Justin said, yell at him? He said, Ty, if somebody yelled at me, I would like immediately never do business with that person just out of principle. I said, well, <laughs> he's not you. This guy doesn't have your psyche. He doesn't have your psychometric personality type. He's from New York. He's different life experience. I said, trust me. Well, he didn't, Justin didn't listen to me and the deal didn't close and deal closed. Finally, not because Justin listened to me, but because he got, got so frustrated. One day I could hear in the office next to me, Justin just yelling at this guy going, you either do this deal, you've been wasting my time, or I'm never going to call you back. And lo and behold, the guy said, you're right, let's do this deal. The lesson is, when you're not adaptable, you're not great at sales. When you have one shtick, when you have one personality side of your personality that you bring out all the time, you're a much less persuasive person. And that's why Charlie Munger says, <laughs> when all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. When all you have is a hammer, every problem looks like a nail because when you have one approach to fixing something, if all you have in your tool belt is a hammer, and you go to a house and there's a screw, but you don't have a screwdriver. You're not adaptable like that. You got one tool. You're gonna start banging and destroying things because a hammer does not always fix the problem. So be adaptable. Have multiple tools in your tool belt. Adaptability, number two. Number three, which speaks right to that. You need at least four tools in your tool belt. Four tools in your tool belt. Okay? So tool number one that you need, well, the overarching tool that's divided into four categories is you need to understand something. I've kind of developed this. I'm in the process of trademarking it. It's called the PACE system, P-A-S-E. So going back to the beginning, you know, number one, number two, and now we're here at number three. Um, I'm going to do a little one, two, three. Okay. Sometimes when I get on these long talks, I forget. Number three, 
have multiple tools in your tool belt, I recommend four. The overarching system I use is called Pace. You're welcome to borrow it from me. Can't steal it, but you can borrow it. You gotta give it back at some point. Pace, practical. You need a set of practical persuasion tools. You need a set of AA, which stands for action. You need S, okay? These are different parts of your personality, by the way, you bring out. S, and then E is emotional. So I have a sales full-on four-month training program. It might be closed when you see this, but you can go to tylopez.com slash sales video. And I've got a video training and stuff. tylopez.com slash sales video. Or we'll put the link below or whatever. So what I train my salespeople and what I've trained myself with this pay system, I give you the high-level one because I'm not going to sit here and do a four-month video all in one shoot. I need to go to bed soon. P, there's, remember, sales principle strategy number one in the new science is understanding that you gotta, you gotta get in people's heads in a way that they listen and hear. Not just one. Remember, it means hearing means they take action. Like they actually, oh, you heard me. You did something about it. So some people you need to bring out your practical side. Practical people that you're trying to talk to, you're trying to persuade, they need numbers, they need logic, they need concrete step by step. So if I'm selling to a P, so if I'm adaptable, we'll talk about this later, that you have to learn how to read people, but the sales thing is a big conversation. I'm gonna get as much as I can in here. But when you read a person and you discover and establish that they're a P, they're a practical type, that's their dominant energy, then I'm gonna come in with a lot of logic and numbers. I'm going to be like, listen, the reason you want to buy this from me is because it's got 17 features and my competitor only has three because, you know, it's 44% less expensive than the nearest competitor because you're going to get these 18 different blankety blank widgets. So when you sell to practical people, you sell very down to earth. I speak slower. Practical people don't really like to be rushed. They need time to compute and logically process the numbers. So that's P. Then you have the A's. A stands for action. These are the P. This is like the guy that I told Justin to yell at. Action. They're ready to go. You can be a little more aggressive with them. You can be a little more mean. They're kind of like, you know, gung-ho. If you've seen the movie Wolf of Wall Street, the scene where uh, Matt McConaughey is like doing like the whole like, oh, uh, like doing that. That's kind of an A person is like revving themselves up. So when I'm speaking to an A, I got to speak in their language. So I adapt and I bring out the A side of my personality. By the way, you have all four of these personality types. You don't have to fake it. You just have to be good at bringing out. That's what, that's what Bruce Lee meant by water. The water isn't faking it to change forms. It's just expressing its true essence in a different form, but it's all genuine. You don't see water. I mean, if I take this water and I pour it in a, in a, in a you know, a pan and it goes wide, I don't go, oh, that water is manipulating the situation and not showing its true self. No, it's water takes the shape of the vessel. So I'm not asking you, or when I do sales, I'm not asking you or my salespeople to be disingenuous because we can all, we've all been around a salesperson who's like cheesy and fake. That doesn't work. But there's a part of me that's P, practical. So when I speak to a P person, I bring out that practical side of me that likes to know what's going on in a nice, orderly, fashionable, you know, numbers way. Uh, there's a part of me that's A. So when I speak to an A, I'm like, yo, get with the program. This is the best thing out there. Come on. You're going to procrastinate all day. I'm a, little, I'm a little more aggressive, not too aggressive, but my words are a little more aggressive. Okay? Then you have an S. An S is social. S's are jolly people. In general, an S is jolly, nice. They're more concerned about building a relationship with you than buying from you. In fact, the biggest mistake you make with an S is trying to be a P. You get all the numbers and why you should buy from us. They really just want to play golf with you. They really just want to have a drink with you. They probably would have bought from you. They probably would have been persuaded. But they need to like you as a friend. The way their brain works in the deep subconscious wiring of their mind that they don't even understand that there's a psychometric trait. By the way, if you're wondering, is there a science to the PACE system? Absolutely. Um, the most recognized uh, by the academic world 
accurate test. It used to be the big five. It used to be Myers Briggs a long time ago. It's kind of the Jungian one. That's kind of been discredited. I've gone through the Myers Briggs. It, it's okay. The retest accuracy is relatively low. Um, then they developed something called the Big Five, which was considered the standard way of understanding people's personalities. In uh, 2000, 2001, it was updated by a scientist. I think he's out of Canada. I forget his name right now, but he developed something called the Hexaco Score. It's a great book. He uh, written about it called The H Factor of Personality. I recommend it for everybody, especially if you want to get good at sales, reading people, social life, all this stuff. So, uh, Hexaco score. So my pace system is roughly based off the combination of the big five and the Hexaco. So for example, in Hexaco, you have honesty, emotionality, extroversion, agreeableness, conscientiousness, and openness to new experience. And then those divide into sub facets. So you have 25 sub facets. So you have um, sincerity, you have uh, greed, avoidance, modesty, um, fairness. Those are your H's. Your E's uh, are the emotionality. You have fearfulness, anxiety, uh, sentimentality, and dependence. And then you have for the X, you have extroversion. I'm not going to go through all these, but extroversion of things like social boldness, things like social self-esteem. Uh, they have one um, that is, is uh, what's it called? It's like your energy level. I forget the name right now. I'll remember in a second. But... The pace system is more built around the extroversion, but also it's built around uh, the, the facets like conscientiousness. So practical, what I'm calling P, I'm giving you like, this is like, I'm, I try to live my life like half street smarts, half book smarts. My grandma is more from like a book smart family. My grandma went to Yale. My grandpa, like they went to Yale. That's where they met. My dad's from the streets of Harlem. So all the stuff that I teach is kind of like my life experience, <laughs> what I inherited, maybe which is half and half. So for those of you who are more P's who might be doubting, does Ty know what he's talking about? Is he just making up a pace system? No, I can talk to you about this for a long time. I tested 300,000 people last year myself, more than any psychologist in history. So I, I or more than any psychologist last year, I did because I got the internet. I can reach a lot of people. Most psychologists do tests on like 80 college students. I did, I think I actually did 250,000, not 300,000. Um, but so this pace thing is built around the hexaco factors of conscientiousness. Um, the A, the action, is basically around these social boldness and things like that. There's other ones like extroversion, narcissism, somewhat A's or more. But S, is built around the agreeableness factors in Hexaco. So S is a social person. They're like, these are people that have high agreeableness, okay? Uh, agreeableness is composed of things like flexibility, forgiveness, um, so like low stubbornness. Like a, a social person in in the way I, I understand it and use in sales, it's kind of like that person that's just like, yo, you wanna go have a drink? They're like, yeah. And they come off a little flaky. And when you do sales, they're the ones who don't want to make you feel bad. So say, yeah, yeah, I'll buy from you. And then they kind of stop answering your texts. That's how you know you're dealing with an S. Because they're more about the social life. So they didn't, they didn't want to, an A will be blunt with you. A P will be real blunt with you. They'll go, I don't want this. I calculated my pros and cons Excel spreadsheet and this does not work for me. Okay, and then lastly, you have E's for emo, uh, that's emotional. And that, of course correlates with the hexaco emotionality, which is anxiety. It's primarily one we can use as anxiety. Um, we live in a very anxious culture, society. Um, anxiety is probably at an all-time high because we have urban living, that's one. We have low um, social dependence, familial dependence. I used to live with the Amish for two years. All the Amish live near their parents. It lowers your anxiety to be around people you know. We now migrate to places that we don't know anybody, our social circles disrupted and so on. We also live in a much more complex society with, with a lot of the natural, quote unquote, social mores and constructs pulled out from under our feet. Things like, for example, the Amish are like how people used to be. As you grew old, 
You didn't go in a nursing home. Your kids took care of you. Well, that's gone in modern society. Now you grow old, they dump you in a retirement home. That happens all the time. And so, and when you're young, you used to be, your dad taught you, your mom taught you, your neighbor had a little apprenticeship. You learned a career. You had a few choices. Now it's like, go to college, get $1.2 trillion in college debt. That's the current U.S. debt. And then we throw you into the world with a million options. You haven't really been trained for it. And now you have debt and anxiety goes up. Uh, so... That so emotional people I think are on the rise, and you have to deal with them very special uh, specifically because the E type people are how do I say um, they're very sensitive, they're relatively thin skinned, uh, they're a little flighty. You can lose the deal if you're trying to sell to them because they like <gasps> you trigger their anxiety. Don't trigger their anxiety, okay. Now, let's keep moving because we've got, we got still a lot to cover. Number four, learn to read people. Learn to read people. Now, I've kind of touched on this in number three, but number three, the strategy I was giving you is more you need to adapt between the four, P-A-S-E. But now for strategy number four, you got to know how to read them. And this, I could shoot a 38 our video. There's things from body language, tonality, but I'm just going to give you one strategy which I find to be the simplest to start with. It's like a lexicographical, I believe that's the word. Um, it's word-based, vocabulary-based, okay? What I mean by that is people give clues in their language. In fact, there's a whole set of scientists that all they do is study language. One of my mentors, Jonah Berger, who I think he teaches at Wharton now. He went to Wharton. He's he's one. Of, he wrote a book called Contagious, on, which is a really good book. I recommend you read. By the way, um, I was just on the phone. I do mentor calls. I have mentor. I pay for mentors. By the way, I spend anywhere from fifty to two hundred thousand a month on being trained by smart people, whether it's fl- traveling to them, putting them on a retainer, or whatever. So, a lot of the stuff I'm teaching you, I'm giving you for free. It cost me a lot of money to learn. It's just talking to, to Jonah Berger, and he he just did this huge multi-year study, uh, specifically around things like customer support and even sales, about language, how language matters, your choice of language. But I'm gonna go a little further. You can listen to people's language and their choice of words, and learn a lot about whether they're a P, an S, uh, an A, an S, or an E. For example, it's pretty simple. When you're trying to sell something or close a deal to an E, they bring up the word fear a lot or some deviate, uh, derivative of that word. So they might say like, well, you know, I want to sell this house to you, but you know, I'm just worried I'm not going to be able to, I'm worried about what the taxes are going to be. I just was doing a deal actually with a guy. I've been buying up real, I buy raw land, either put it in agriculture or I develop it. So I buy a lot of land that's in the path of development or good good agricultural land. I own a food brand, some food brands. And uh, so I was closing a deal with a guy. It wasn't a big deal. It was like half a million dollar deal. But it was strategic because it was attached to another piece of property. So I wanted this deal to go through. And I had other people doing the sales for me. I had one of my lawyers doing negotiating. And he couldn't close the deal. Like we worked on this deal for like a year. And finally, I stepped in, and you know, I hadn't trained my lawyer. L- lawyer's more trained in law, and he's not a black belt. I tell everybody, you want to become a black belt in sales. I And to be a black belt, you need a lot of training. You need a lot of hours. I'm probably maybe more than a black belt. I definitely have more than ten or 20,000 hours in sales. Malcolm Gladwell, what do you say? You need 10,000 hours to be a master. And then they kind of amended that and said you need 20, 15,000. Then they're like, you need 20,000. Well... I got 20,000 hours in sales and persuasion and my lawyer didn't. So the deal stalled and I stepped in and I began to just listen to the words, listen. And I realized I was dealing with an E. And how did I know? How was I able to read this guy? Well, he said, he goes, finally, and by the way, I would say he's an EP, practical emotional. Because most people aren't just one thing. The reason I think he was a P is because he knew his numbers very well. 
when I said, how much do you owe? Because I wanted some owner financing for this deal. I didn't want to have to pay cash. I like to use my cash. The whole point of real estate is don't use your own cash, by the way. When you look at non-leverage returns on real estate, it's not really that good. Business is better. So when I buy real estate, I want to do it pretty much cash. So I go, I go to this guy and I'm like, hey man, what's up? Like, I'm just listening. I don't actually say, I'm thinking in my mind, like, I guess get him talking. By the way, all sales, get him talking. And he's very practical. He's soft-spoken. He's slow to speak. P's usually don't interrupt you. A's will interrupt you because they're action. He didn't interrupt. So I was thinking it was a P, but then he said one thing. Because I, everything he was saying, I was like, why can't we close this deal? Like, he wants to sell. Then he, he brought up, he's like, I'm afraid the taxes. And when I hear the word afraid, I go emotional. P's aren't afraid. Practical people aren't afraid. They're more computing. They're like, my taxes will be 37% of this amount. They don't, P's are more like Spock in Star Wars. I mean, Star Trek, not Star Wars. <laughs> uh, or R2-D2 or C-3PO in Star Wars, to keep the analogy and metaphor going here. Um, A's have no fear. That's why they're A's. They're like, seize the moment, seize the day, carpe diem, right? S's are so jolly, they have low fear, but E's have fear. So he's like, I'm afraid if I sell it to you this way, I'm going to have a ton of taxes. So I just said, let me think on it. And I came back the next day. I said, I won't say his name. I won't say his name. He might watch this video. <laughs> Some of these guys watch my videos. I go, Mr. X, I just realized something. If you finance this deal, we can spread your taxes over way longer, which is what I wanted to do. Okay, this is like the ultimate lay down, exciting sales situation for me because I'm going, is he going to, I hope he hears what I'm saying. But since I was speaking his language and I, I brought up fear, I said, you know, I know you're afraid of taxes, man. That sucks. I'd be afraid. And I start repeating the words back to him. It's not mirroring. Mirroring, I don't really agree with, but it's like a dimensionalizing pacing that I call it. And I just said, eh, hey, you know, I think, look, man. Yeah, I'd be afraid too. I got a way. And then I went switch to P. I'm like, here's a practical way. I'll pay you over time. I'll pay you over five years. This will defer a lot of the taxes. We structured the note. You don't have anything to fear. And he said, yes, like literally within five minutes of me staying that. And the deal closed. I closed it when my lawyer couldn't close in a year or something. Other people had worked on this guy too. This property had been sitting there, I think, for sale six years. And because I understood how to read people and how to adapt and I understood how to get people to hear, hear him, I didn't manipulate him at all. He was excited. It's the ultimate sales situation where, where they're like more excited than you are. And deal's done. I signed that deal. I actually posted it, I think, on my social media, the, the HUD form. Close the deal. It's a beautiful piece of land um, with a lot of potential. A lot of potential. So... That's how you start. You listen to words. So P people will speak in numbers. I'm listening for numbers. If they start saying 33%, if it's my tax bracket is this, and if they sound very robotic, I go P. If they're using robot words, they're P. If they begin action-based words like, hey, like I emailed you yesterday. What's taking so long? Then you know you're dealing with an A. Impatience, A, action. If they say, let's, what are we going to do to make this go forward? Or if they're a little bit just aggressive at all, aggressive choice of words. In fact, I remember one of the first times I ever did a phone sale. I had built up. See, I started doing it. I started as an entrepreneur when I was a teenager. And I, I was one of the first people to do internet, use the internet to get customers. For sure. Because I was one of the first people on Google AdWords. We're talking way back in the beginnings of the 2000s. And I built a funnel. I was like, if you want to. I forget what it was. It was either life insurance or like financial planning. And this guy, I still remember, I think he might still be a customer. I sold the company to my business partner when I moved back to California, but I, he might still be a customer. Anyway, I get on the phone and the dude was like, he had filled out a form asking me to call him, but he must have forgotten. So when I called, he's like, why are you calling me at night? And I almost like got scared and gave up, but I'm an A. I was like, I just told him, I was like, cause you told me to. <laughs> So I, he, I didn't realize, I knew nothing about pace. But in hindsight, he was an A 
Because that's something an A would say. Bluntly like, why are you wasting my time? Why are you calling me? It was like 7 at night I called. Because on the forum, he's like, call me after 6. So I just told him, as an A back, I was like, because you told me to call you right now. What am I supposed to do? And when A meets A, he understood me. And he was like, oh, okay. And he turned into my first big customer. I remember I made like $10,000 on a deal with him, which was a lot to me back then. And so unknowingly, now I would know how to deal with that. You know, if an A comes at me with an A, I usually hit him back with the A vibe. If somebody hits me with the jolly, and, and you may call that mirroring, again, we'll touch, maybe if I have time, I'll touch on what I think of mirroring. There's advanced mirroring, which I believe in, and there's the cheese ball mirroring, which I disagree with. Um, so I hope this is showing you how matching their language that's already in their brain, their, their primary driving energy, you become very persuasive to them. Okay, number five. Maybe I'll touch on this mirroring thing as number five. Number five strategy. Forget most of the stuff that's being taught out there. I'll tell you why. The science has been updated. We have social media. We, like I said, a lot of the science was based back then. It was done weird, weird academic research that was done on Ivy League campuses to 80 students. I mean, a lot of this stuff with social media, you can learn more about psychology than any psychologist ever. I post a picture, I get 100,000 likes on Instagram. I post another picture, I get 50,000. Well, psychology is like one's more appealing than the other. And I delve deeply into it, look through the 32 cognitive biases, blah, 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 all this stuff. So let's talk about what I think is flawed in a lot of what you are going to read in certain sales books and strategies. Um, one of them is mirroring. So there's cheesy mirroring, which I don't believe in, and there's advanced mirroring, which does work. I just kind of gave you an example of advanced mirroring mirroring in strategy number four but strategy number five here uh is ignore a lot of the stupid sales stuff here's an example that's been taught for years to people god knows how many people have failed with this it's this thought of mirroring so you go to a you go to a meeting and and the person's kind of lean forward and speaking fast so you mirror them and because the the, the concept is that people are narcissists so therefore they want to see themselves in you, which is definitely uh, a little bit of truth and a lot of falsehood to it. I mean, look, opposites also attract. Like, I've always been attracted to blondes. Not only blondes, but certainly I'm not attracted to women who look like me. <laughs> this is an absolute given. Maybe I'm a narcissist, but I ain't a narcissist to the point where I want a little Ty Lopez woman popping up on a Tinder date, uh, that's definitely going to be a swipe left. Okay, so uh, that kind of mirroring that's taught is very cheesy. And I'll show you why it'll backfire and just practical. Okay, if you happen to meet an emotional person who's high on anxiety and they lean forward and they start speaking fast because maybe they're a little uncomfortable in the situation, if you start doing the same thing, you heighten the emotionality and you heighten their anxiety. In fact, I like to do anti-mirroring. When I'm speaking to somebody who's like, oh my gosh, I'm really like worried. I don't want to get neurotic like that. I don't want to be speaking that way. You don't want Woody Allen meeting Woody Allen, right? That vibe. So there's a time when you do anti-mirroring. And that's why I said the cheesy ways that sales are taught, they, they work like 50% of the time. So they can write a book and say, see, it works. But they only point to the 50%. The system I'm training, like this is design doesn't always work in practicality to work 100% of the time because you adapt. There's only so many variations of people. So this one, you adapt to all the variations. So um, yeah, remember that. Most of what's being taught is a little bit stupid, not to sound cocky. What's another example? Hold on one second. Um, not to be rude, but... Okay. Keep it in. I like to keep my videos raw. Uh, okay. So, what's another kind of part of sales that I think is mistaught? Again, I think these strategies that are out there that are, for example, like always be closing, ABC. That's a common, common thing. Always be closing. Well, 
yeah, in a way, but not in the way that people interpret it. Like, don't always be pushy on people. And again, you get sales when you're pushy, primarily from A types and S types. So when you push hard on A types, they take action. If you push hard on S types, they're so jolly, they kind of eventually give in, even though they're a little flaky. Don't work on P's and E's. P's and E's, P's are like a rock. If they, so what happens is sales training is like, oh, always be closing, go for the sale, call them. If you need to call them 63 times in a row, call them, call them, call them. Don't give up. Well, there's a time, every good general knows there's a time to retreat. You regroup and you come back later. There's lots of deals that I do that I realize I'm not going to close them now. I retreat and I put them on my CRM and I call them back in six months or 12 months or 18 months and I close the deal then. There is a natural progression and timeline to sales. So I don't like the always be closing thing. What I'd like to I'd like rather be always be listening. Now that sounds cheesy, but what I mean is always be reading. How about always be reading people? ABRP. It's my new one. It's not quite as catchy as ABC. I guess ABC catches on because it's like alphabetical. ABC. Okay, I can remember that tie. I'm gonna be a good salesman. ABRM. Always be or ABRP. Always be reading people. And when you're reading them, you're also reading the time frame that they're on and you're reading their personality type and you're knowing if they're a P or an E, you can't push them on it as hard. If they're an A, you can. So that's just a, two examples of what I mean by ignore a lot of the modern science and training that's still out there. It's like based on, it's kind of like Myers-Briggs. Like Myers-Briggs is great for like 19, uh, sorry, 1950s personality tests. A lot of people are still doing the Myers-Briggs Myers-Briggs is not a great test. No offense to all the websites out there, like 16 personalities and all this. It's just bad science and any good, like it's the laughing sock of modern science, really. Although I do like Myers-Briggs for something. I think Myers-Briggs is good for dating, for reading people. I think it, it, it gives you what you need to know whether to know if you'll be a, a good romantic match. But uh, it's been updated, baby. Science is a little better <laughs> when you broke your leg in like 1915, they were giving you penicillin and all that stuff. Now we have other things that are a little better. You know, not everything's better about modern medicine, but uh, certain things, certainly it's better to break your leg now than it was in the Civil War when they would like, you know, go, okay, put a little piece of wood between your teeth and here's science. Well, a lot of the modern sales training is kind of like Civil War. Like, yeah, it kind of works, but you lose a leg. <laughs> minor point like you kind of lose but you lose a couple million dollar deals yes you do get one big deal but you lose 93 other deals if you don't mind that everything's jolly in the new system okay we're on number six two to go by the way if you not to be pushy here but um i'm gonna put a link if you're watching this on video you can go to tylopez.com slash sales video and um again Depending on when you're watching this video, my my I have a program, a black belt. It's called Sales Mastery Black Belt. It's probably closed. I only open it a few times. You can go on the wait list. Um, it's a paid program. We also sometimes will open up a crash course. Uh, again, not trying to push you. Honestly, I shot this video just because a lot of people go, Ty, back a long time ago, you used to do these free videos where I could just listen to them. They were long and podcasts. And can you do that again where you're not like, you're just sitting in front of the camera talking. So, but I'll throw in a little, I guess, right? Even the Super Bowl is allowed to have a little commercial break, right? So, so sue the Super Bowl before you get mad at me. Um, all right, what's number six? What do you need to know in the new science of sales? Strategy number six is, survey says, learn to use the internet. New science of sales, I still see people forgetting to use this thing called the internet. It is very powerful. It is like, you know the goose that laid the golden egg that they used to tell in child, you know, childhood stories? Or Jack and the Beanstalk. Wasn't Jack and the Beanstalk about like a, they were trying to. Yeah, but there was some money thing in it or something. I forget what it was. Somehow related to money. Maybe I'm mixing. About the beans. Okay, I'm thinking of a duck. The goose that laid the golden egg. That's what everybody wanted. Sorry, I'm, my childhood story knowledge is very weak these days. I'm getting 
not quite a child anymore. Um, but the goose that laid the golden egg, it exists. The money-making machine, money on trees, it kind of exists and kind of doesn't. At the risk of being accused, I get accused sometimes of being get-rich-quick scheme. Ty sells hopes and dreams. He should sell depression and nightmares. That's what I'm going to start saying. Shame on me for selling hopes and dreams. What else are you going to sell? By the way, you want to be good at sales? Sell hopes and dreams. Real ones, not fake ones. Maybe what they mean is Ty. When people don't like me, they're like, Ty sells fake hope and dreams. Not really. If I tell people you can make a living without being a nine to five cubicle job, is that still like... <laughs> I remember when I first started telling people to sell on the internet, it was still kind of new. And people were like, internet, man. And then like... Billionaire after billionaire was created after dropping out of college with the internet. And people are like, okay, maybe there's something to this. I got asked to speak with uh, Chris Paul, a friend of mine plays in the NBA. We got asked to speak at this community service government. It was kind of a government thing. We get there. It's all these kids. And it turns out, I did not know this, the program is like to encourage kids to go to college, which is great. I have nothing against that. I was happy to be there. And they come around, they got to big camera on Chris Paul and they're like Chris tell the kids why they should stay in college why did you stay in college and he's like uh I didn't stay in college I dropped out and was drafted by the Charlotte Hornets and went on to make a lot of money I think this year or last year he signed a 150 million dollar contract or something like that and then they're like Ty you've been successful as an entrepreneur why'd you stay in college? And I'm like, oh, yeah. And then afterwards, me and Chris looked at each other like, I think they invited the wrong two guys here. Um, but anyway, going back to uh, um, whatever I was talking about, hopes and dreams. Uh, what was I saying? Meandering like I do sometimes. Um uh, rewind my brain. Going back five, going back six. Number six was. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. Zach has a great memory, actually. Um, he is the rain man of my friends. Uh, <laughs> definitely, definitely. Definitely, definitely. How many jelly beans did you drop? Or whatever it was, a Tic Tacs that he dropped. Remember that in the rain man? Toothpicks. 425 minutes, 63. Uh, use the, learn to use the internet to sell. It becomes an extension. It works when you're sleeping. There is nothing that sells better than the internet. Uh, if you don't believe me, ask Facebook. Mark Zuckerberg, who runs the ad platform. That's how they make money on Facebook, by the way. Google, ask Google. Uh, largest part of Google revenue is from ads. People are like, Ty, everything should be free like Google. I'm like, are you stupid? Or just ignorant, or both, combined. Stignorant, uh, stupid slash ignorant. Nothing's free in this world, by the way. Um, but the internet is as close as you're gonna get to a money-making machine for your sales. So build a funnel to generate leads. That's what I started doing back in 2002. It worked when I was in the nightclub business. I used the internet and email marketing to continue to drive new people to the clubs and the nightlife events that I ran and I've had thousands of people show up to the point where my biggest problem was the fire marshal shutting things down. I see nightclubs and they're just like, I right, go to Vegas, these massive nightclubs. They don't even collect people's email address. If I own one of those clubs, I go, we got a faster line, short line and a fast line. We got three lines, VIP line for the people who buy tables. You buy a $50,000 table in Vegas, you get in without waiting. Then we got the second line, which is like the preferred VIP line. That's just people on our email list or our text list. You double opt in. We send you, add your email. Here's an iPad. You fill it out. I used to do something similar to this. And then the third line is for everybody too stupid to join the email list. They got to wait in a long ass line. Well, guess what? They would be collecting hundreds of thousands of emails. Then once a month, they could be like a go. If you're in Vegas, we're doing a special thing here, but no. People are still trying to do old school sales. There's people with Rolodexes. Or there are people even using CRMs. They're not properly using their email list. They're not properly understanding how to create a lead generation funnel. They're not using social media. By the way, social media is extensions of internet. I got millions of followers because 
it's like a very long, large sales funnel. If I get 100 million people to watch my stuff, the top of my sales funnel is automated and it's, it's in the, it's not in the seven figures. It's not in the eight figures. It's in the nine plus figures. That's a lot. And therefore, whenever I need to sell something, when you start with the top of the funnel wide, you make a lot of money, even if only a small percentage of people buy. And so you got to master the internet and the digital age. If you're still 100% reliant on it, and a lot of salespeople think they're up to date. They're like, look, Ty, I'm on, you know, infusion software. Look, Ty, I'm on Salesforce. And I'm like, woo, you figured out a CRM. We were using CRMs in 02. Okay. 02. That's not up to date. It's like, you're almost two decades away from that. What is even more cutting edge? SMS marketing. Uh, there's chat bots. There's simple email lists, but an email list needs to be emailed often or else it gets stale, stagnant, and people don't open because they don't know who you are. Your unsubscribe rate and your complaint rates go up and then your delivery goes down. So you got to develop out like a full 360 to use an old cheesy or a cheesy digital consultant word. Go 360, man. Like you got your social media, you got your phone sales. You might even still be sending out letters. You have your email list. You have your SMS. Boom, boom, boom. You have your video marketing. You have your Instagram, your Facebook. Get 360 on this thing. Trust me. I can tell you. People accuse me of whatever they want. People love me. People don't always love me. But nobody says this dude doesn't know how to reach people. And nobody says Ty doesn't have a 360 funnel. You know you're in trouble when I'm starting to talk in the third person, by the way. So I don't like to say tie. It's a very weird way. By the way, reading people, narcissists often speak in third world. I have a Stalin book for some reason behind me somewhere. And Stalin, uh, oh, we put it at the bottom. There it is. Right there. Oops. It's very confusing to, it's right there. <laughs> it's very backwards because I got all confidence in water. Anyway, Stalin started out as a very normal guy. And by the end, he would only speak about himself. Not only, but often speak of himself in the third person. Um... Stalin was an A, by the way. I would guess he was an A. A little too action-oriented. A little too aggressive. I think he's responsible for his own son killing and 60 million people. Yeah, don't try to sell to Stalin. The Stalin type needs to be just cut out of your sales funnel. Just put him in the unsubscribe list. Okay, and now what is seven? Do do do. Do, do, do. There's many things I can make seven. So what do I feel like talking about right now? Because there's really like more like 200 strategies to be good at sales. It's funny when people come work for me in sales, you know, like when I really start rolling out all the things, the strategies I have, people are like, wow, that's a lot. That's going to take me a while. I'm like, yep, that's how the game, I've been playing chess for a long time. You want to get good at chess? There's a lot of different permutations. There's a lot of different openings. And uh, almost infinite. And that's how sales is. So, in fact, I'll take it there. I'm going to take it there. Number seven, game theory, baby. Learn the science of game theory. And I want to make it very fun for you to start. Watch the movie with, uh, well, it's called, um, uh, it's on game theory. It's about Nash. It's called, is it, not theory of everything. What is this fucking Beautiful mind, thank you. Theory of everything, Stephen Hawking. My mind is a little tired right now. It's late at night, and I'm on East Coast time while I'm here in California. Uh, so, basically, in this book, in this movie, Russell Crowe is this scientist who goes a little cuckoo, and he. It's all about a true story of how he won a Nobel Prize for development of game theory. Now, game theory. There's a whole other conversation. I should record 62 other videos to explain game theory. But here, here is the basics. You already kind of learn game theory in school. You just understand it. Remember this physics principle that they taught you? I don't think they mentioned this in Beautiful Mind, the movie that I recommend you watch. But I'll just update you. Every action has an opposite and equal reaction. And this is where people mess up. So when you think very linearly or very... like. You just see things very simply. You miss how the human brain works. So, for example, always be closing. Well, if you call people too much, what happens? It 
Every action has an opposite and equal reaction. It works on some people, but in the game of life, does one strategy always work? If you play soccer, does one kind of shot at the goal always work? No, you gotta vary it up. When you play basketball, does it always work to shoot a three-pointer all the time? If you're the Houston Rockets a couple years ago, that's what they tried. And to me, it was too one-sided of a strategy. I don't know if you remember Chris Paul got hurt. They're playing Golden State Warriors. I was going for Chris, Chris Paul's a friend, so I was going for the Rockets. He's out. They still almost win, but that last game, they shot like the most three-pointers in any playoff game. And I just didn't agree. You know, I agree to disagree with their coach. I'm going, switch it up, baby. Every action has an opposite and equal reaction. When you always shoot three-pointers, you become predictable. Think about football. American football, we, for those of you not watch, not from America, gridiron. If you always throw the ball, the defense adjusts the game. So they spread out, and, and they don't have as many people on the line. They have people in the back. You know, they. it's predictable, and so it stops working. So you have to run the ball up the center, or you have to do a variety of plays to throw people off. So when it comes to sales and persuasion, kind of one of the overall things I hope you take away from this free brief training and podcast video thing is that the real way and the real science is that there is no one thing that works. And this freaks people out. People always come to me, they go, Ty, what is the one book? What is the one book that will ensure my success? Well, I say, you need to watch Beautiful Mind and understand game theory. If the game of life was so simple, that one book, one book would answer all your questions, guess what? Homo sapiens would not be the dominant force. We'd all be, you know, some kind of, we'd be part Neanderthal. But humans were able to outthink Neanderthals. In fact, if you do your 23andMe or Ancestry DNA, all of us have a little Neanderthal still in us because it's not too long ago that Neanderthals were kind of our cousins on Earth. And so... Why did Homo sapiens become the dominant form? Well, I don't know the exact reasons. I'm not an anthropologist. My grandma is actually. I'm not an evolutionary uh, expert, but I will tell you, talking to those experts in great part, in fact, if you read the book, Richard Dawkins' book, The Selfish Gene, one of the first kind of books that brought this evolutionary psychology and biology to the masses, along with a guy named Trivers and all these great people are still alive. Um, I got to interview Dawkins, fascinating guy. Because humans understood game theory better. We knew that we had to switch it up. We knew that what worked when we lived in Africa did not work when we migrated to Asia or migrated to Europe, North Europe. We begin to have to adapt to win the game. And so for those of you coming into this video and you're like, you know what, what's the one thing that's going to be great at sales? You know, I'm friends with Wolf of Wall Street, you know. What's the one way to sell this pen? Sell me this pen. Sell me this pen. You're on the wrong track, baby. You're always going to get, my sales guy's going to destroy you if we ever call the same client. Because I'm training them to be black belts in adaptability. In, go, in not saying what's the one way to sell the pen, but what's the one way for that person to be persuaded to buy that pen. Because in, and know that it can change in mid-conversation. If you become too practical, I'll give you an example. Just a practical example. Going back to that deal I told you that my lawyer couldn't close, that I stepped in and closed. If I had been too emotional, I knew he was emotional and concerned about taxes. If I had stressed the word fear too much, I might have made him think of a whole new set of fears that he didn't have. For example, I could have ruined that deal by like, you know what? I totally get it. You're afraid of tax. Um, you're afraid of your, you know, but boy, it could be worse. Your property tax on the new place you buy might be way higher than it is here. And all of a sudden, by me playing the game of fear too much, I destroy the deal because all of a sudden he goes, oh my gosh, I never even thought about that. I got to... I'm, I'm looking, because he was looking to move to another state. Let me call and let me talk to my attorney in the other state and be like, Is my ta are my taxes going to go up? Maybe I should just stay where I am. Maybe I should just take this place off the market. 
So when you become too one-sided, when you only have one hammer and you're always using that tool over and over, all of a sudden it begins to backfire on you. When you're playing soccer and you always come on the right-hand side, when you're playing football and you always throw Hail Marys, when you're playing basketball and you always post up the same person and throw it in the right low post, all of a sudden the defense begins to adapt and it doesn't work anymore. So always remember, nothing works all the time. Be like water. Be like water, and you will have tremendous success in persuasion, sales, closing, and negotiation. Okay? I hope that's been helpful. Now, they say that you get about 50% more retention in memory. Write a comment below. What is the number one thing you took away from this? What stuck out to you? It can also be something you disagree with. I am an A. I'm not afraid of a little controversy. What's something you really took away that you agree with or something you really don't agree with? Leave a comment. I'll look through these and reply. And uh, yeah, by the way, like I said, I've got a four-month certification training program Um and I also have, that'll get you a black belt. Not a real black belt, by the way, if you didn't know. But it's my Amazon, uh, my Amazon. It's my uh, Sales Mastery uh, black belt. It's a four-month program, step-by-step. Step. If you're watching this on video, go to tylopez.com slash sales video. It may be closed because we close it often. So just go on the waiting list. Or if there is the crash course available, you can take the shorter 10-day crash course until and just wait until we open up the full course. I, I don't like to give all my ninja skills away, but I don't give them all in the black belt even. I have a red belt, which is the grandmaster. I do jujitsu, so I use those belts. But I can get you to black belt uh, in a pretty powerful way. I've seen this work. I've trained a lot of people. I've done a lot of sales. And um, yeah, training in that new science of sales. So I hope this has been helpful. Whether you get in the paid programs or you just watch this free one, I hope you get some value from it and um yeah leave me a follow uh if you're watching on youtube or facebook or ig or if you're on my podcast if you wouldn't mind leave me a little review leave an honest one you can just be like what was the one that borat did in that thing <laughs> Ak- akia or nish nish <laughs> that was maybe bruno in one of the ones he, he tells, anyway, I'm not going to go into that. Uh, yeah, leave, leave me a review. Tell me if it's any good. Tell me if I seem to know a little bit that could help you, bring you value, or the inverse. All right? So welcome to the series, by the way. Be watching. I'm going to try to do them a couple times a month. What they should have taught us in school, the new science of sales, the seven strategies. Good night.